podcast, where we speak with experts, leaders, and change makers about movements of social change that have transformed the landscape of Canada and the way we live our lives. On today's podcast, we're speaking with one of Canada's most prominent environmental activists, Zipporah Berman. We're going back to the very beginning. You were originally studying something other than environmentalism. You were studying like fashion design or something like that, right? I was. Right out of high school, I was in fashion arts design. And yet you kind of switched course, and you've been on this course ever since. So what would you say as sort of the, the inspiration behind that environmental activism and your, your first foray into this world? Well, it, there was this nagging feeling uh, throughout the time that I was in fashion arts design. I mean, part of me loved it. It was fun, it was interesting, it was engaging. And there was this nagging feeling like I was, um, like I was missing something, like I, I should be doing something. And um, my first summer after my first year, I, I went to uh, Europe backpacking around with my sister. And that was one of the, that was in the uh, very early 90s was it? No, it was 1989, and um, that was a year that uh, people were literally dropping like flies on the streets in many cities across Europe because of air pollution. Right. So I was in Athens, and one of my dreams, I had been studying art history, one of my dreams was to see the Acropolis. And we went up to the Acropolis, and it was, it was before the restoration, it was literally eroding with the acid from the air. We looked down on Athens and it was just this yellow cloud. And I remember getting to my hostel and doing this and there was just this black streak across my face and I was coughing up black goo. And I just thought, my God, this is not okay. We left Athens and we thought, we're gonna go hike somewhere beautiful. And we ended up in a forest in the Hartz Mountains that is entirely dead and left standing as a testimony to acid rain and the impact of industrial society. And those two things, and. It had a massive impact on me. And I came back home and, and it was like my eyes had opened to environmental issues in a serious way mm -hmm. for the first time and then I couldn't see anything else. And that's all you sort of focused on from then on in. How many years have you been involved in the environmental movement, not only in Canada, but in, internationally at this point? Um, 25. 25 years. Could you think to yourself, what is your, the proudest moment? I mean, there's, I'm sure there's a lot, but even maybe one or two of the moments that really, really make you proud. Um, as someone who's worked so hard in this field, um, what have you achieved? Mm. Um, for me, uh, two moments really stand out. One is um, when uh, the British Columbia government announced the permanent protection of the Great Bear Rainforest on British Columbia's west coast and the creation of a, a new um, conservation financing initiative that would support local communities and First Nations so that they weren't forced to decide between poverty and clear-cut logging their territory, that they had other options. And um, so I had been working on that for 10 years. And um, when we started that campaign, we were called crazy. We were called um, eco-terrorists. Um, I was... Um, I was called, you know, every name in the book that I was trying to destroy British Columbia's economy. Will, you know, I remember this big headline, Greenpeace, will these people wreck BC, you know, above the fold in the newspaper. And um, it took us a long time to create a really informed conversation to show that there were options. Um, and, uh, and, and then there was a moment where there was the Premier of British Columbia standing with First Nations chiefs and the logging industry and the environmental groups announcing a new way of um, designing the economy and a scaling up conservation past what anyone ever thought was. That's amazing. And a lot of the movement at the beginning, I think, seemed more into um, the civil disobedience, right? The, the Clackwatt Sound uh, mm -hmm. was considered one of Canada's largest civil disobedience movements, right? Um, was there an evolution of tactics for you in terms of how to approach environmental activism over the years? I mean, since you know that's how it began with this mm -hmm. disobedience. Um, anything that has changed and lessons learned for you as an activist? Well, I, I think for me as a very young person getting into this work and being very outraged by what I was seeing, um, the protests, the rallies, the blockades, they felt right, you know, speaking truth to power, we're just going to stop this. 
Um, and I learned over the years uh, that, you know, the, the harder work is trying to figure out solutions because solutions are messy. They're not perfect. And, uh, and to figure out solutions, you do need those protests. You need those rallies. You yeah. need those blockades because they create the power. They're, they create the problem decision makers have to solve. Um, but you also need to be willing to sit down across the table um, with who I thought of back then as my enemies, you know, industry and government, because actually they have the knowledge and capacity to solve their problem. So if you actually want to campaign and not just complain, you need to act, you need to sit down and work out the solutions. So, so I think my work evolved from in that scenario and the forest work from blockades to boycotts, working in the marketplace to create financial pressure and corporate campaigns to sitting down in the boardrooms and working out solutions. But I wouldn't say that that means that now I understand you just need to sit in the boardrooms. Because right. I think you need all three. I think you need to have the controversy, you need people in the street, especially now in the climate era. We need people to stand up and say this is not okay. And to create that controversy, those headlines, and you know, so decision makers realize they have to solve it. And then we also need people who are willing to do the hard work of working out the solutions and sitting in those boardrooms. And do you think that your place right now today, as you look back and as you look forward, where is your place in that, you know, the grassroots, the sitting in the boardroom, the, you know, policy perhaps? Um, it's in both places. Yeah. I think as someone who's done this work for a long time, um, you know, who can sit in the boardrooms and wear a suit, you know, and um, that it's even more important for me to be uh, standing in front of the coal plant, you know, standing in front of the blocking the new pipeline. Um, and, and, in, and in some ways, it's kind of therapeutic. If you sit and read the science that I read all day long with the terrifying statistics about the impact of coal and oil development on our climate, we're not safe right now. And we have very uh, little time to turn it around. We have the capacity to turn it around. We now have the technology to, for a new way of, of living. We have electric cars, we have solar energy, we have um, the price of renewables you know, dropping through the floor. We have the capacity to make the changes that we need to make, but they're not being made. And so um, I plan uh, to be both on the blockades and in the boardrooms because I think we need both. And on a personal level, I think we are inspired by working in community and, um, and using our voice. And as far as the challenges that Canada, I'm looking specifically at Canada now, but internationally as well, if you want to mention that for sure. So it's in, um, as far as the challenges, uh, environmental challenges that we face today, um, and looking back over the 20 years of, of the types of challenges that mm -hmm. we faced before, have they evolved? Are we in any better place? Where? What do you like? You, you mentioned how it's still pretty dire. It ha but have they changed at all? Have we taken a few steps forward? What would you think about that? I think um, that as a society, we've gotten better in some ways in um, recognizing the importance of conservation and protecting the environment. Um, in our everyday lives, I think corporations have gotten way better. They have to now. They address these issues. You know, when I first started, and you started talking to a major corporation about an environmental issue, you'd be talking to their um, public relations office. Now they all have environmental affairs and environmental sustainability offices. They have experts. They have scientists working for them, looking at their impact. So in that respect, we've made progress. Um, but at the same time, um, we've had a bigger impact on the planet than we ever thought we could have. So it used to be that you were dealing with localized issues in your backyard. It was this logging. It was this toxic effluent into that river. Um, but the cumulative impacts now of our industrial society, primarily of fossil fuel use, uh, we now know um, is affecting the climate everywhere. That's affecting forest loss on the entire planet. That's acidifying our oceans. That's affecting how much drinking water we have, whether a dramatic increase in uh, floods, droughts, and extreme weather 
the situation that we're in right now is much more serious than anything I think many of us ever imagined. And, and so um, we've come a long way. We've come a long way in designing technologies and, um, the, and we now have the capacity to make the changes that we need to make. Um, but we also are facing um, much graver issues at a much larger scale um, than I ever imagined we would be. What I see today that I didn't see 20, 25 years ago is that um, these issues are connected. You know, I thought that First Nations treaty rights was a very important issue, but you know, not the issue I was working on. Mm -hmm. And um, oh, water scarcity, it's good someone's working on that. I work on forest protection. Oh, climate change. The fact is, these issues are connected. And we cannot address climate change or ocean acidification or forest loss without also simultaneously addressing um, jobs and justice and treaty rights. Those are issues that are entirely connected because the solutions um, are about um, distributing power in every sense of the word. That's what democracy is about. That's how we'll create uh, a cleaner, just, and livable societies. And it makes the issues more complex, um, but, it, um, but it also makes the solutions much richer. And just to take a step from that, do you think you're alone in realizing that, or do you think other people have also adapted that approach in, in, in this new age of environmental activism, people working together, seeing the holistic perspective the way you have? I'm seeing that yeah. all around me. I was um, really lucky to be a part of the um, climate march in New York last year. 400,000 people marched in the streets of New York, and that march was led by unions and frontline communities and indigenous people from around the world. It was a coming together of people from all walks of life. And, um, and the conversation there uh, was about climate change, but it was also about jobs and justice, and I'm seeing that um, every day. And that's making us much stronger, less siloed. And one other question, with the First Nations community that you mentioned also, um, do you feel there's a more of an openness there to work with other, the, the other people, with industry? Because um, that always seems to have been you know, a big part of the struggle in Canada in terms of working together versus in silos. Do you feel there's a more of a movement in that respect? In, in, type of work in a lot of the First Nations communities I work with, um, in all of them, they're working in some capacity um, with industry, starting to build relationships uh, with environmental groups. Um, but in almost every First Nations community that I'm working in, they're also faced with um, huge pressures from industry. Uh, to, these are poor communities and you have oil companies, gas companies, pipeline companies coming into their community and saying, what do you need? I'll write a check. You just agree not to oppose these projects. Right. And these are communities that need those community halls, those schools, that's the, that money to support their communities. So they're being put in a terrible position and I think it's extremely difficult um, but there is a huge willingness uh, to work together uh, to try and solve the issues and they also realize in a lot of circumstances that they're more powerful if they do. Okay. Focus today uh, is where, what would you describe uh, specifically where, what you're doing today? I'm working uh, on trying to uh, stop the expansion of some of the dirtiest fuels uh, like the Canadian oil sands um, and to ensure that we don't build more fossil fuel infrastructure like pipelines but instead start investing in that cleaner technology in renewable energy and solar energy and wind energy in electric vehicles in public transportation those are the solutions that we need and that will also stimulate our economy and create safer clean jobs for people at home you know, we have a generation of Canada's children who are, who are, you know, watching the skies, waiting for mom and dad to get home from Fort Mac. And so this is not just about um, fossil fuels. It's about safe jobs. I mean, one of the great things about windmills is they don't explode, right? <laughs> we have a solar spill is actually just a sunny day. <laughs> this is about safer, cleaner jobs at home where people live and not 
building those mega industrial projects that are polluting our air, our water, and creating an unsafe climate. So it really is about a new kind of economy. And just one last thing, I was curious, if you were looking back at the, at the young person that you were um, when you started off in this, in this field, w would there be any advice you would give her in terms of how, you know, what she should do to best, to take the best, most effective steps forward? I think um, the most important thing that we can do um, is listen and then act. We need to listen to ourselves, to that little voice that says, it's not okay. Um, actually what I really want to be working on is this. Because we do our best work in the world when we're listening to that voice, when we're being true to ourselves. But I think also listening to others. Um, to really see people and not just positions. Um, because that's how we'll create the relationships and the trust and the solutions uh, across divides. Um, but if we just talk it out, um, we, can, we can, it can lead to a lot of navel gazing. You know, A lot of people are what I call issue swimmers. They know a lot and they're righter than right. And they spend every day reading more and more and more. But what are you doing? What are you doing to create a conversation? What are you doing to create an event? Are you actually talking to a decision maker? We live at a moment in our history that requires us to act. And I want to be able to look at my grandchildren and tell them that I did everything I can. And I think most people do too. Perfect. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you for joining us today on the History of Social Change podcast. I'm your host, Elisa Birnbaum, publisher and editor of Sea Change magazine and producer of the History of Social Change project. Be sure to stay tuned as we discuss other social change movements that have transformed the landscape of Canada and the way we live our lives.